Okay, so talking about the multiplier here and the multiplier effect. Okay, multiplier effect. Basically what the multiplier effect says is that any spending that is done in the economy will be spent again multiple times or some percentage of that dollar will be spent again multiple times. And that's kind of what we're going to work through here today. So when I spend money, whoever gets that money, that becomes their income. They get that, spend it again, becomes somebody's income. So on and so on and so on until we reach the end. The amount of the multiplier, rather than just going through and saying, okay, I spent this and then you spent a smaller percentage and so on, we've come up with the multiplier. And the size of the multiplier is determined by how much people save and how much people spend um, of their disposable income. And so anytime we get more disposable income, we're going to spend some of that and we're going to save some of that. And the amount we spend and save becomes what we use to determine the spending multiplier. So there's two important ideas when it comes to the spending multiplier. The first one is the marginal propensity to consume. This is any time disposable income increases by a dollar, it's the amount of that dollar that we will spend. And, of course, the opposite is any time we get an extra dollar, the amount that we save becomes our marginal propensity to save. And the two of these numbers will always equal one. Because when you get a dollar, you can only do one of two things with it. You can spend it or you can save it. So the MPC plus MPS will always equal one. Okay, and so there it is, nice and concise. Whenever a consumer gets an extra dollar to spend, they'll spend part and save part. And whatever they spend will find its way to someone else and they'll do the same thing, and so on and so forth. So let's first talk about the marginal propensity to consume. This is the portion of extra income that we choose to spend, the MPC. And the way we find the MPC is dividing um, the change in consumption divided by the change in disposable income. So if I find $10 on the ground, that's money I didn't count on, it becomes extra disposable income, or I get a $10 an hour raise. If I spend $9 of it and save $1, then our marginal propensity to consume is 0.9. I spent 9 divided by the 10, and that gives us 0.9. And so the change in consumption divided by the change in disposable income equals the MPC, 9 over 10 equals 0.9. And now the marginal propensity to save is going to work much the same, just uh, with savings instead of spending. And so whatever we don't spend, that becomes our savings, and this is known as the marginal propensity to save. And we take the change in savings divided by the change in disposable income, and that will give us our marginal propensity to save. So if we get a raise or find $10 or whatever, and we spend nine of it and save one, then our MPS is change in savings over change in disposable income equals MPS, one over 10 is 0.1. And so if you remember, the marginal propensity to consume was 0.9, MPS was 0.1, and so that will equal one. Always, always MPC plus MPS equals one. So... How does this turn into the multiplier effect, okay? Well, the thing that limits the multiplier is always going to be savings. The more we save, the smaller the multiplier will be. And so um, every portion that we don't spend, this is what gives us the MPS. And so the multiplier, right, once we know MPC and one MPS is the reciprocal of the MPS, which is 1 over 1 minus MPC or 1 over MPS. And you'll see a chart and you'll see how this works. So the larger the marginal propensity to consume, the smaller the MPS and the larger the multiplier will be. And you should be able to figure this out. The more we spend, the more money that will be circulated throughout the economy. 
And so to get the multiplier, there's your formula, 1 over MPS. So here you can see a chart with uh, the multipliers. Uh, if the MPC is 0.9, uh, then 1 over MPS is 1 over 0.1, which is 1 over 1 tenth, so that makes the multiplier 10. And going right down the line, as we uh, consume slightly less, our multiplier goes down slightly. 10, 5, 4, and 2. Now, this is where it gets tricky. This is what you really need to understand. There's two ways that we use the spending multiplier. So let's first assume that the marginal propensity to consume in this economy is 0.75. So you can be asked a question in one of two ways. The first one says government spends $100 billion. How do we solve this problem? Well, if the government spends $100 billion, we want to know how much money will be added to our GDP. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the multiplier. So the MPS must be what? Yes, 0.25. And so that's 1 over 1 fourth, which is 4. So the multiplier is 4. Now government is spending the money. So we want to know how much is going to be added to the economy. So we take the amount that the government is spending and multiply it by the multiplier, 4 times 100 billion, and we get 400 billion. And so when the government spends 100 billion dollars, GDP is going to increase by 400 billion dollars. This is the first way that you can use the multiplier. The second is saying, for example, that the US has a recessionary gap of 100 billion dollars. What's the first thing we need to do? Figure out the multiplier. What's the multiplier? Same thing as 4. Now, what do we want to figure out? We want to know how much is spent to close the gap. So we're given the final amount. We're saying our economy is $100 billion short. What times 4 will give us that $100 billion? And so we divide the amount by the multiplier. 100 divided by 4 equals 25. And so this tells us if the government spends $25 billion, it will close the recessionary gap of $100 billion. These are the two ways you'll see it. You need to be able to figure out what's being asked and how to use the multiplier. Tax multiplier. Tax multiplier is the same idea, but the problem with the tax multiplier is, is all of the tax cut is not being spent. And so the tax multiplier is always going to be smaller than the spending multiplier. Okay, And the tax multiplier is also a negative number because an increase in taxes reduces spending. Okay, And so... Taxes go up, spending goes down, GDP is going to decrease. Same thing, a tax cut is negative times the negative tax multiplier. Tax cuts are net positive numbers. Okay, and I'll talk to you tomorrow about how this can also be um, figured out. There's kind of a, a self-check to that. And so... Our formula is negative MPC over 1 minus MPC, or negative MPC over MPS, or negative multiplier minus 1. I like that last part. The multiplier is 10, subtract 1, put a negative sign in front of it. So the tax multiplier will be negative 9. But any of these three will work, whichever one you feel comfortable with. And so here are some tax multipliers. And if you compare it to uh, what we looked at before, you'll see that each of these is one less than the spending multiplier. And again, we'll continue to practice, and so you'll get work with this. Like always, the first time is always a little bit tough. And then finally, let's look at some multipliers and tax multipliers together. MPS is 0.1. MPC must be 0.10. 1 over 1 tenth, multiplier is 10, tax multiplier must be minus 9, and so on and so forth. You could memorize these if you had to, but it's really not something hard to figure out, 
and you should be able to figure this out on your own given any of the numbers. And then finally, the last multiplier we have is the balanced budget multiplier. So when the government spending is matched with the same amount of taxes, the change in GDP ends up being equal to the amount of the spending and tax cut. So if government increases spending by $30 billion and they increase taxes by $30 billion, $30 billion is going to be added to GDP. Why is that the case? Let's look. So we have the spending multiplier plus the tax multiplier, 1 over MPS plus negative MPC over MPS. You reduce that down, 1 minus MPC over MPS, which equals MPS over MPS equals 1. So whatever the amount of spending is, multiply it by 1. And once again, we'll do this in class tomorrow. And as we work through examples, hopefully you'll see that this is not such a difficult concept. Uh, remember, any questions, please bring them to me tomorrow, and I will answer them for you.